Hey everyone, we're starting our webinar today. Uh, we'll be talking about mistakes. I'm Thibault, your host, uh, the head of Rental Scale Up. We're right on time. So actually I'm gonna give maybe a minute for people to join. I see the numbers going up, more than 30 people already. So thank you so much for attending this morning, this afternoon or evening, wherever you are. Uh, we will be talking about those biggest mistakes that property managers have done in their businesses. Um, as you may know, uh, there's, a, there's a book that's just been out covering this exact topic uh, called The Cash Rental Secrets. And you can, see the, you can see the cover here. And I'm very fortunate to have uh, Brooke, uh, the, the, um, the person who gathered all these stories from, he will tell us how many, but I think like there's like at least 30, uh, 30 50, property managers. 32. 32, look at that. 52, uh, 50. property, 52 sorry about that. So uh, property managers sharing their, their mistakes. Uh, but what we're going to be doing today, we want to make this interactive. So Brooke will basically guide us through, through the book and through a few chapters of that. And thanks to uh, David and Lino, uh, who are going to introduce themselves, we'll be talking a bit more about their own experiences uh, as property managers, uh, how how these different uh, mistakes resonate from the strategy, the marketing, communication, how does that resonate with their own experiences? Um, obviously, what you'll be also be able to do, uh, you'll also be able to use the comment section as usual. In the comment section, uh, why you can go straight ahead, straight ahead, sorry, in the comment section and maybe introduce yourselves and tell us where you are. That'd be great. If you know Brooke, David, Lino, or myself, just don't hesitate to say hi. What we're going to do uh, is we're going to be presenting each of the topics we have for today. Uh, again, David and Lino will uh, share one of the experiences, but I would love you to also share your own mistakes. You know, Don't be afraid. We're all going to be talking about our own mistakes. Uh, feel free, again, to use the comment section, and you'll be able to share your own mistakes, and I will be your voice. Share that. Uh, uh, share along the along the show today, and in the end, we're gonna have a Q and A session, ten minutes, so you can ask anything. All right, we're just two minutes after the the mark. Let me get started. So again, I'm I'm Thibault, the head of Rental Scale Up. I'm happy to have Brooke, David, and Lino. Uh, maybe, why, gentlemen, why don't you uh, each of you uh, why don't you introduce yourself, starting with with Brooke? Hello, Brooke. How are you? Sure. Uh, thanks, Thibaut. Super excited to be here. Thanks for pulling this all together for you and uh, Yuvika. Really, really appreciate pulling this together. So uh, excited to highlight it. Uh, just yeah, my quick background. Been in the short-term rental space for about 16 years. Uh, started a company called Vantage Resort Realty. Uh, I exited that business, had some various other leadership roles within the space. And then about four and a half years ago, started Ventory. Uh, Ventory does one thing and one thing only. We help professional short-term vacation rental managers grow their inventory, you know, grow their supply, add more properties. Uh, we've got about 50 people on the team. We've helped over 650 companies with their inventory growth efforts. And uh, yeah, excited to uh, share some of the secrets we weren't learned from this book here and, you know, sharing the, the 520 mistakes between the, the 52 contributors and co-authors and super excited to have these uh, two uh, panelists with me with uh, David and Gotti and, and Lino. Great. David, could you, uh, for those who don't know you, could you go through uh, your pro and tell yeah. us who you are? Hey, everybody. I'm Dave Angotti and um, been in the industry a little bit over a decade now. And we started out uh, as homeowners and then moved into the property management role, found ourselves in this industry, which has been uh, uh, a lot of fun ever since. Uh, we grew a company uh, very rapidly and made lots of mistakes along the way. So Brooke limited me to only 10. Otherwise, the whole book might have been my mistakes. Um, and those mistakes ultimately uh, you know, shaped our company and helped us get better over time as we corrected those mistakes as we went. From there, I did exit that business and uh, became an OTA and, uh, and then launched several OTAs and ultimately was acquired by Guesty. So that's uh, the quick story there with a few acquisitions in the mix. Nice. Thank you, David. Lino, how about you? 
Hello, everyone. Excited to be with you today. And uh, first, I want to thank Brooke for for putting this uh, this book together. Um, you know, it actually made me feel normal reading it. I thought I was the only one that has blown it on multiple occasions and at multiple levels. So kudos to Brooke to uh, making us feel all like we're in this together. Uh, I started in the business as a property manager in uh, actually Fourth of July weekend of 1996 with a company called Abbott Resorts here in the panhandle of Florida. And then uh, worked up through the IPO of what became Resort Quest, uh, and then into Wyndham Vacation Rentals North America, uh, and then uh, departed that business uh, in 2019 uh, to join the Be Home 247 team uh, as the president of the company. And really, our mission is to um, make your jobs easier, allowing you to focus on uh, guests, owners, and your company culture, and rather than pushing paper through departments which has been uh, part of part of my history there. So very excited to be here with you today. And, and if I can keep you from running into a, a single wall, that's a success. <laughs> it's so great. Again, Brooke, David, and Lino, that's so much experience here today. And we are going to be talking about mistakes. And as I said, there's, there's a book, right? Vacation Rental Secrets that, that Brooke, you put together. Maybe can you, can you give us some background maybe about the book? Yeah, so why don't we just uh, jump in? Because I think the next couple of slides talk just about how it kind of all came came to be. So if it's with you, I'll just uh, kind of get started. So cool. So let's get started. So first off, uh, I want to thank, there's 52 co-authors, 52 contributors that really pulled this, uh, pulled this all together. Without them, this would have never happened. I mean, all I did was just was kind of the person that kind of consolidated it and uh, put it into a book. So these are the real uh, real authors, real uh, contributors of this book, so they get all the the credit. So thank you to the fifty two people that uh, that contributed to make this make this happen. So speaking of which, uh, how did it all start? So it was it was actually Easter Sunday this past year. I just you know the, the extended family all left. I just poured a nice big glass of wine, sat down on the couch, and just kind of relaxed for a little bit. Was flipping through LinkedIn, and I came across the post uh, in a completely different vertical, completely different industry. And it just asked for people to share their top 10 mistakes that they made in building and growing their businesses. And I was like, what a brilliant idea. What a brilliant, because truly you, you learn from your mistakes and there's something about being vulnerable, you know, that uh, from these top leaders, you know, they're not invincible. And um, so I literally emailed four of my friends that all owned vacation rental management companies and as always, uh, my friend uh, Ryan Dane quickly responded, and I thought it was brilliant. So I posted on LinkedIn the next morning, and it went viral. And then the other three people responded, and I posted those as well. And again, the response was just as, uh, as good as uh, Ryan's. So for the next 52 days straight, I ended up uh, posting these, uh, these top 10 mistakes. And just again, the feedback was so great. Again, it just showed that people could be vulnerable. And it just, again, there's so many learning lessons, you know, from that. So uh, from there, uh, I actually ended up going to a conference. I went to the Northwest VRP conference and a gentleman came up to me. And this was about halfway through the series. He said, hey, Brooke, I absolutely love the series you're doing. I actually print out every one of those top 10 mistakes and I put them into a binder. And I asked him, I said, so you're kind of creating your own little book, right? And he said, yes. And that was the really the 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 impetus, the catalyst, whatever you want to call it, that started uh, and launched the launched the book. So what I realized, though, is most of these mistakes, they, you know, even though there's 520 mistakes, almost all of them fell into one of 10, you know, buckets. So that really became kind of the, the chapters of the book. So the book, actually, the first half of the book is all everybody's mistakes. And then the second half of the book is these uh, is 10 chapters and these are the 10 uh, common themes. So we'll go over those real quick. So that top 10 list is this. We had number one was strategy. Number two was team. Number three was processes. Four was finance and accounting. Cleaning, inspections, laundry, and safety. Communication, feedback, and guest marketing. Inventory acquisition. Taking on the wrong owners and the wrong inventory. Technology. And then networking conferences, community, and local competition. So this is how they all kind of uh, fit together. So in the book, this is each one of the chapters. Now, unfortunately, you know we only have a limited time here, so we can't can't go through all these. So what we did is uh, David, Lino, and I, and we kind of went through and we narrowed it down to six. So these are the six that we're going to be going over. So with that said, I'll uh, just kind of jump right in. We'll just start with strategy. So number one, strategy. 
the four kind of sub uh, or five sub bullets that kind of fell under strategy were chasing shiny objects, expanding too fast into markets, bias for action, trust your gut and communication. So what I'll do is I'll kind of throw it over to David first and maybe David, you could kind of uh, highlight uh, what you what you found with the mistakes under strategy. Yeah, I think the uh, chasing shiny objects there is definitely, man, right front and center. Uh, you don't have to look any further than the Burma trade show floor. There's a lot of great vendors down there. Uh, you know, my company, Lano's Brooks. So they're, we're, we're part of this problem, if you want to think of it that way. But there's these great companies down there and row after row after row of them. And oftentimes I think a property manager is going to hit that floor and ignore the underlying problem and rather think that technology or one of these solutions is going to fix their problems. Oftentimes that's not the case. You can think of many of these uh, tools and softwares like a hammer. You can either hit your thumb with it or you can learn how to use it right and drive a nail with it. So I think that that one uh, in particular is, is one that, that we're all guilty of. That could be even developing something in-house if you're a larger uh, team, or it could be uh, chasing that one uh, homeowner instead of uh, staying very disciplined to a, a, an overall strategy there. Um, so we have to be careful with that one. The bias for action in property management days, we call this revenue producing activities. And we wanted to bias towards anything that would produce revenue and stay away from the things that did not produce uh, revenue. And so we wanted to look at things like that it, it kind of under that umbrella. David, I could not agree more. Uh, chasing shiny objects was something I was guilty of for, for many, many years. You know, as a property manager, you've got an issue in a particular component of your business. So you go out and you find a, a widget or a thing to help with that. The, then you go on to the next uh, component of your business, you find something else. The problem is that you think you're becoming more efficient because you've got a slick user interface. In reality, many times you're just pushing inefficiency further away from the front lines. Not necessarily a, you know, a bad thing, but there's a blessing and a curse with technology. When I started in the business, uh, we uh, didn't have much good technology out there. In fact, I was running a third of the US of uh, Resort Quest and Wyndham's inventory on an old AS400 platform. Try telling your uh, intern group every year that you're one of the you know, leaders in the business uh, when you don't have a mouse or and a green screen. So, uh, you know, when you think about how we pull together technology, what I've seen a lot of folks do is they, they accumulate a bunch of tools. And the first thing they do when they change a tool is complain about how it doesn't look, act, or work like the tool they replaced did. Um, and so I would say, make sure you understand the tool, you leverage it to its complete capability, and you solve your process issue as well. Sometimes just changing the tool isn't enough. You've got to look at the holistic process of the thing you're trying to correct in your business. Um, the other thing is um, when you, you say you know, trust your trust your gut, to me, this is a very simple industry. We tend to overcomplicate it with a lot of noise. This is the hospitality space. And, and what does that mean? It means delivering great experiences to other people. So when you're evaluating a tool or a process or, or whatever else, you've got to see or think about how that thing is going to positively impact your owners, your guests, and your company culture. And it's, it's typically not more complicated than that. Well said. Well said. Thanks, guys. Um, I think uh, all entrepreneurs have that uh, that first one there, chasing shiny objects. It's taken me, I think, four businesses uh, to finally realize stop chasing all those little shiny things. So great feedback. Thanks, y'all. All right, let's jump to number two. Go ahead, Tebow. Yeah, exactly. So um, we've heard like great examples from, you know, from Lino and from David, you know, uh, around the topic, the mistake being you know, chasing, sh chasing shiny objects. If you, I mean, there's like close to 90 people here, feel free to also share your own mistakes in the comment section uh, as we move on to the second topic. So just leave a comment here. And I think it's great to hear from, from everyone here because we're all in this. <laughs> we all make mistakes. And I think it's the first thing is to, uh, you know, be aware that all can make mistakes. That's, that's the value of this webinar here, right? It's like people sharing their own mistakes. And I think that's, that's so Brooke, that's also what we have in the book, right? People uh, share the mistakes and they even give their names out there, right? These 52 people, they, I don't oh, can say the proud of it, but they, they own it, right? They own it. 100%. Uh, so exactly. So that's okay. Let's go to topic number two. Great. Thank you.
All right, number two is team. And I love this quote from one of my idols, uh, one of the kind of the leaders in our space, Clark Twitty with Twitty uh, Vacation Rentals down in uh, Outer Banks. Uh, this business, as with so many others, remains very simply all about people. It contains a lot of other things, but everything is wrapped up in good people. So I thought that was a great quote to kind of lead that uh, chapter. Um, so yeah, number two, team. Again, uh, some of the sub bullets here we had is hiring, uh, personality assessments, uh, firing was a big one, uh, nurturing, delegating that visionary integrator relationships, which is part of EOS or entrepreneurial operating system, which was a big theme throughout the book. And last but not least, culture. So uh, let's see, Lena, you want to kick it off? Absolutely, uh, Brooke. Uh, so to me, the one that really stood out here was culture. And it actually ties in to a bunch of the other bullets as well for me. Um, you know, when I think about all of these great brands in the business today, and there are, you know, tremendous things happening in our space. Um, I, I look at a logo on somebody's shirt or, you know, a, a, on their website. And many times we think that our brand is our culture. And really, it's the people that create the brand and the culture. And as a leader, we tend to, um, you know, not put enough effort in developing our teams. And uh, to me, the the process that that I really sort of near the end of my time with with Wyndham and Resort Quest and the like, I was finding myself spending more time getting the right people, but getting them in the right positions, and then equipping them well for success. And then the fourth component is get the heck out of their way. You know, you it's amazing what your teams can do when nobody cares about who gets the credit, right? And so put the right people in place and then equip them to do the job that you need done and then stop micromanaging the movement, if you will. Um, and uh, so that, it really tied for me a lot of things up here. The right people will absolutely accelerate your business if you let them do the job. The wrong people can poison it quickly. So don't make projects out of people um, you know, really uh, uh, invest in them and their success, and you'll you'll benefit. So uh, uh, on our end, uh, you know, I would just start out with saying that culture, to, to Lena's point, was something that we didn't have figured out in the early days. It took us a, a little while to really figure out how to coalesce behind these bigger goals, and rather we were making it about the tasks that each employee had. Once we identified really the two big goals, it got a lot easier because then everybody plugged into that one mission. And the two big goals that we had back uh, at SmokyMountains.com property management was one, we were going to treat every owner like they were the only owner. And so that meant when you're on the phone with them, when you're solving a problem for them, that's the only owner that, that exists. And we didn't care about the other 100 plus owners at that point. The other thing was we were selling dreams, not heads and beds. And so once we realized we were selling dreams and each owner had to be treated like they were the only owner, then all of a sudden we could, we, the culture started to not really figure itself out, but at least be easier to plug people in where their true skill sets lie. Um, in addition to that, I would say uh, a, a mistake we made was not using personality assessments. And uh, I'm a big believer in culture index now, having seen the power of that particular per personality assessment and exposing both the weaknesses and strengths and how a team's going to fit together. And we could have definitely avoided some some of the pitfalls that we hit along the way. Yeah, I, Dave, first off, David, I couldn't agree more. I mean, for me, this was probably one of my favorite chapters and like personality assessments like uh you know, predictive index and culture index have been absolutely instrumental in our success here at Venturi. Um, and then that other one, that visionary integrator relationship, I, I honestly believe I would still have Vantage Resort Realty right now if I had an integrator. The reason I ended up exiting that business, the reason I sold that business is really I didn't have a good integrator. I was a great visionary. I was a great uh, strategist. I was not a good executor. And uh, it took me a long, long time to realize and that goes right in with that personality assessments. Make sure you get that right person that's in that that GM or that COO role um, and uh, kind of follow that EOS playbook of, of doing that visionary integrator relationships. A question for, for three of you on, on that topic. Uh, imagine I'm a, you know, a property manager you know, with, a, with a 50, 50 properties and maybe uh, you know, I'm the one who's built a company and I, you know, things were successful because of me, but sometimes things could not grow because of me too, right? So 
what would be your advice for people who, in terms of culture, I'm, I'm the founder, but I may be in the way. So what could be some good advice you give, give to people what not to do or what to do here? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll take it first. I mean, first off, very often the visionary founder is the one in the way. Like they are the ones trying to micromanaging it. And I think Lino said it perfectly. It's like hire the right people, give them the tools they need to be successful and get the heck out of the way. Um, you know, it, it, many, very often these founders and, and CEOs, they just, they micromanage everything and uh, end up screwing up things. So yeah, le leverage your team, make, give them the tools they need to be successful and get the heck out of the way. I'd say the, the motivation behind getting out of the way is also pretty critical. So for example, if the motivation is convenience because you don't want to take uh, an appointment with an owner that may be firmly attached to you, that's probably the wrong motivation. If the motivation is what Brooke was talking about, where we're trying to scale this thing and provide better service, then that's the right motivation. motivations. So you, you kind of have to look at what the underlying motive is. Um, and then I, I think right around that number that you threw out, 40 to 50 is where you need to make a, a great hire that's like a GM type role. Typically, that's where you you hit a ceiling on growth otherwise. Yeah, well said. Nothing more to add there. I think both of those were were spot on. Great. Fantastic. All right. Let's go to the third topic. All right. Chapter number three, communication, feedback, and guest marketing. Kind of our, our sub uh, five sub bullet points here. We had internal communications, owner communications, feedback, conflict resolution and guest communications. Uh, so David, you want to start with this one? Yeah, I'm going to kind of take the end there, guest marketing. Um, at the beginning, I was so concerned about getting a booking or getting some bookings uh, where, you know, I didn't, I didn't really care where they were coming from. I wasn't measuring things well. I was really concerned with building a book direct brand, which is a great, uh, a great thing to go after. Um, but I didn't look at customer acquisition cost or CAC, and I didn't have a good understanding of CAC on ADR. And so basically, uh, the, the idea here is uh, we could all keep all of our properties book direct at 100% occupancy if we just set them to a dollar at night. Of course, none of us want to do that. So that illustrates this idea of how CAC and ADR and all these have to play together. But having a really good understanding of that and also being willing to invest similar amounts of money in your own book direct campaigns as you're willing to pay Airbnb, Verbo, whoever all in is another piece of that. So the guest marketing and CAC was uh, critical. Once we figured that out, we were willing to make huge investments in building SmokyMountains.com into uh, a, a big book direct brand that actually was so successful that it became an OTA. Um, in addition, um, under guest communications, this came uh, to the surface during the wildfires of 2016. We prepared for some. Uh, we prepared for some disasters, but never did we think we would have a disaster like a wildfire rip through uh, town and and hit every single area of town all at once. That was quite scary and exposed a weakness on our guest communications. So have those uh, disaster plans ready. Yeah. Uh I could not agree more there, uh, David. I, I think the two that jumped out to me were first owner communications. Um, the the thing, you know, we don't typically communicate with owners unless we have good news to share, right? And probably the best example of the last couple of years uh, with these inflated ADRs, you know, coming out of COVID and in Florida, it was even, you know, amplified further because we were one of the only states open. And so we were all making a ton of money. Most owner communications I saw from other companies were really touting how successful they've been <laughs> over those you know, two years. The ADRs were great. We grew them you know, 100%, 200% in most cases. And our little company, we were doing just the opposite. We were saying, hey, guys, uh, don't spend all this money. This is an artificial bump. We, we are not going to you know, see this for many, many years to come. Our goal is to hang on to that ADR as long as we possibly can. But we know that we're going to be coming off of this mountain at some point. We tend to communicate with owners when there's only good news. And in reality, we should be communicating everything to owners as their advocate of their assets in the market. Good, bad, ugly, they are our partners. In fact, many of us don't have a business without the assets of the owners that we are servicing. And so uh, they should be intimately involved in the information about our markets and the like. So that one jumped out. 
The other one was feedback, right? Is that we all do, many of us, I think, do surveys. And with large companies uh, in my past, we've done NPS surveys, net promoter score surveys. And we get very, very excited and we rally around the seven, eights, nines, the tens. Man, woo, we're doing so great. And, and literally the people that give you an eight, nine and, or a 10 are telling you that yes, they would promote you to a friend or relative or colleague, right? That's the answer. Then we get very lazy. We're like, okay, great. We're going to celebrate the nines and tens, whatever. They literally told you they would promote you to others, but we don't ask them to. We just celebrate the score and don't put that score into action. And, and so that one to me used to drive me nuts with larger companies uh, in, in terms of utilizing the feedback you're, good, you're getting. Even the bad feedback needs action behind it to, to either turn that person, that guest, that owner or understand what your failures were and correct them so that you don't have to deal in, in that you know, universe again. I think, I think I, I've missed that a lot in my career. Yeah, Lena, we used to leverage NPS as well. And it's uh, so funny you said that, but it, I actually like the detractors because what it allowed me to do is actually get out in front of it. To me, it was a leading indicator before churn. So it gave me the opportunity to, to reach out to that owner, to get to talk to him, figure out what it was, I could fix it. I, you know, there was nothing worse than just getting an owner that told you they were leaving your program. Um, and there's at that point, it's too late to try to, to salvage it. So the NPS is that leading indicator that allows you to kind of salvage that relationship and keep them and make them happy. So, and Brooke, how often do we get negative feedback and come up with an excuse right away? Yep. You know, it's, oh, they, 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 they're they just a tough owner. They're just difficult. Yep. Well, if the problems that they're seeing with their property are related to your responsibilities as the property manager, maybe they're not just a a, a pain in the butt owner. Maybe there's something deeper you need to look into. Exactly. A quick point here, we, uh, Yuvika, who's organizing this event, had a little poll here and we, and and, and uh, David was talking about the importance of the cost of acquisition, right? It looks like 81% of people who replied say, you know what, I do not know my cost of acquisition. Is there, is there a quick way to help people uh, get, you know, get on the path to figuring out what what could we say here and Gotti, you want to take that one yeah sure so this is a big topic it could be its own webinar even but customer acquisition cost is one of the most important things to know in your business it's one of the most important kpis and it's not always uh transparent so for example if you want to see the true customer acquisition cost of an ota it's the cost of the commission you pay that OTA along with whatever the guest pays that OTA. And if there's any net rate increase or inflation in the rate on the way to the OTA, all of that together would become your customer acquisition cost by that channel. If you're looking at a set cost, maybe $1,000 per listing per year, you would divide that by the number of bookings that property gets. So if it gets 10 bookings, that's $100 customer acquisition cost. If it's your own brand, it's a little bit more difficult, but typically that's going to be the cost of your, your website, some of the technology to power that website, your email marketing, and any paid campaigns plus staff members that are doing things like social posts. And you divide that on an annualized basis is the best way to do that and see how, like if you're spending $50,000 total and you got 500 bookings, then again, you're back to that $100 customer acquisition cost. One other thing on this is... If you're close to the same price for a direct as you are for a direct booking, as you are for an OTA booking, you need to double down on direct bookings because the direct booking funnels that you're building will continue to be flywheels for the foreseeable future. You can think of them almost like planting an apple tree. The apple tree is growing and you'll have apples forever versus going to the grocery store and buying one apple. So if you get that cost similar, then keep just going after that direct booking channel is what I would say. Uh, the best and most healthy has a, a good variety of direct booking along with multiple OTAs, not a dependency on one OTA. All of that together is what's going to make your healthiest and most stable revenue stream. Yeah, well, uh, Dennis with Cassiola, who's a great marketer, um, it was funny. He brought up, he's a little bit of a contrarian on this. Everyone obviously talks about book direct, book direct, book direct. He figured out, he knew, he figured out what it ended up costing him to book direct and his acquisition cost was significantly more expensive um, than, you know, booking through the OTAs. So he kind of just gave up, you know what I mean? And obviously he's trying to continue to market his past guests and things like that. But he he doubles down on the OTAs because he realized, again, that that acquisition cost organically, 
like David said, don't forget to put in that, you know, that $50,000 marketing person that's helping you with that, uh, that salary into it uh, as well. So I just thought that was an interesting mistake that he made that he talked about and kind of taking that contrarian approach. Yeah. One more thing on that is um, you have to be careful about how you measure this, because again, this is a long-term investment when you're talking about book direct and your own sites. And so you do want to be careful uh, I'm not trying this for three months and then giving up, rather commit some amount of funds for the foreseeable future for years. It's a long-term strategy and you don't want to just, um, you know, try it for three months and say, hey, that didn't work. Yeah, the, the only other thing I'd add is whether you get or focused on direct versus OTA, um, you need to have a really good CRM tool um, because the every customer that stays with you, no matter how they found you, it's critically important to your business to be for them to become long-term customers that you can leverage uh, as well. So however they found you, make sure that they find you again directly so that your retargeting campaigns are, are strong to, uh, to continue to build that base. Great. This is such a great conversation. And thank you for, for taking that question from uh, based on the poll. Great. Uh, we have three more topics to go through. Let's, let's just do that. Let's do it. All right. Number four, one of my favorite, obviously, uh, inventory acquisition. So we had this broken down into uh, six kind of uh, sub uh, bullets. We had strategy. We had being intentional, uh, investing properly, chasing a very specific demographic, hiring a team around that, and then obviously obviously uh, software. So uh, let's see, Lena, you want to kick this one off on the inventory acquisition? Man, this is one of my favorites, Brooke. Uh, I'm a sales and marketing sort of guy, you know, by, uh, you know, mindset. And and my part of my responsibilities with Wyndham was our growth and innovation for us on a national level. And this is one of those categories that you can't do part time or halfway. You either have a strategy for owner acquisition or or you don't. If you want to grow, you've got to have process tools, the right people, um, you know, in order to, uh, to to do this and a strategy built around the inventory you want. Uh, one of the key things for me is not every owner is the right fit for your business, even though that their property might be. And we all want the same inventory, right? The, the, the owners that are absentee, the beautiful inventory with the highest rates, uh, but then everybody in your market's going after those same people as well. And it can become a, a race to the bottom for your commission structures and, and, and the like. So um, when I think about owner uh, acquisition or, or inventory, it's uh, it's get the, the process and the tools uh, together. Uh, make sure you've got people who are um, really strong. Again, going back to those CI and PI profiles, you don't want an accountant doing this off of a spreadsheet. You want somebody who is a salesperson, who is a marketing person, who uh, is utilizing the real, uh, real estate network in your own markets, creating that, that network of lead generation, uh, and most importantly, trust. I think the, the biggest miss for most people in inventory acquisition, when they put together the, um, the, the pro formas for the inventory, they uh, they tend uh, in many cases to overinflate reality, or they've leveraged you know the last couple of years of the COVID bump to say, man, we're going to do X, Y, or Z. I would always err on the side of caution here and be right versus inflated, because there's no better position to be if in is accurate versus uh, you know telling. Uh, getting somebody's hopes up that they're going to, you know, make a uh, decision to come with you because your, your revenue is going to be, you know, 10 X, you know, uh, higher in, in a particular period. Uh, so just uh, that would be the cautionary tale. There is, is right is better than inflated in your marketing pieces. Man, you can't, uh, you can't put enough emphasis on that, Lino. Uh, that's a mistake I definitely made at one point was in inflating the revenue to compete with what other people were saying. So I knew we were as good as them. So if they were going to say it was going to do X number of dollars of revenue, I knew I could do that as well. But I didn't do my own due diligence. That makes you the villain of the story right away. When somebody's buying a property with a mortgage and then you fa fail them, uh, you're just setting things up for disaster. So I love that one. Um, on, on inventory acquisition, um, you know, I was so excited when Brooke launched this company because we had needed a company just like this and it hadn't existed before Venturi. Um, and, and had Ventori been around, 
in my property management days, I would have signed up with them. And I remember telling him that right after he told me he was launching this company, um, where we failed was we weren't consistent enough. We actually did excellent owner marketing. We sent boxes with t-shirts and branded coffee and coffee mugs to thousands of, of, of homes in the, in the Smoky Mountains market. We sent postcards every month uh, for, for a time period, but then we missed six months. You can think of this almost like the old school newspaper that has the car ads in it. When somebody's ready to buy a car, if they've seen the ad over and over and over again for the past two years, they're going to call you. But if the ad's not there that day, then they won't call you. And so think of it like that. You have to be consistent. No matter how good you are at this, what technology you deploy, the consistency here is, um, is key. The other thing that was a force amplifier for us on the owner sales was our money back guarantee, a risk reversal of sorts. And that was because when we were talking with an owner, we would lose sales in the early days because maybe the revenue uh, that this, this individual over here was offering was higher. And we'd already learned that lesson, so we didn't want to make that mistake again. Uh, but ultimately, what we figured out was we could give them a money back guarantee and say, hey, they're, they're actually telling you an unreasonable amount of revenue. The number we're saying is reasonable. But if you're ever unhappy in any given month, we'll completely refund uh, your commissions that month. Now, with uh, around 140 homes, we never had a single owner take us up on that, but that did help us close about 90% of owners I was talking to. So kind of think about risk reversal and consistency uh, as, as, as you do in our, uh, an inventory acquisition. Yeah, David nailed it with consistency. That's probably the biggest mistake we see is most uh, companies aren't consistent. They'd lob out one or two postcards per year and think, oh, this doesn't work. The companies that are the most successful by far, they're consistently sending out marketing each and every month. Just like you have a proactive strategy going after your guests, they have that same proactive strategy uh, going after owners. Um, and then one of the other biggest mistakes we've seen uh, is uh, people not just picking up the damn phone. Uh, it's, it's so often people will literally spend all this money on marketing and then they've got all these new leads sitting in there and they don't pick it up. We actually, actually secret shopped 100 property managers, inquired about property management services, and they only picked up the phone 34% of the time. When we left a message, they only called us back 57% of the time. So that means you know the vast majority of these leads are going untouched. So if you just are the one that picks up the phone or responds immediately, it's like, you know, uh, there's an old quote, uh, it's like 80% of success is just showing up. So yeah, so make sure you have that right person in there that's always picking up, uh, picking up the phone. All right, let's uh, let's move on to chapter number five, which is semi-related here. Taking on the wrong owners and the wrong inventory. So uh, Steve Schwab, one of the best property managers out there with Casago, he had this quote I thought was great. The ability to offer quality service that you can be proud of will always be blighted by an owner that isn't aligned with your vision. So again, taking on the wrong owners and the wrong inventory, the four sub bullets were choose wisely, prune quickly, communicate clearly, and then owner gatherings. So David, you want to kick off this one first? Yeah, it's um, it's not easy to prune an owner. That sounds real nice there uh, with a bullet point. But in reality, we've sold these owners. We feel like in some instances, we may have failed these owners. Other instances, they may have failed us. But it is a bit of an emotional undertaking the first few times you do this. And what I would encourage is before you prune, make up your mind that this is going to happen. They can't talk you out of it. They can't talk you into another three months. Set a date before you pick up the phone and call them. Go ahead and block the calendar. That way you can say, hey, as a leadership team, we've already made a decision on this. We're gonna to continue to manage your home through this date. Make sure that date's not gonna hurt the homeowner as well. You know, Don't do it right in the middle of season or right before season. You know, Make sure that this is a date that, would, that you would feel best about if you were in their shoes. And then just say, this isn't personal. We like you as an individual. Um, this is about profitability or about being able to meet your expectations. Whatever the reason is, be upfront, transparent with them, communicate it clearly. I think that ties in very well with this uh, and, and go ahead and prune that inventory. What we found was even, um, even good performing inventory uh, that, that from a financial uh, standpoint that was performing very well, 
if you had the wrong owner behind that inventory, that, that property might take as much work as three or four or five similar properties. And it would take you away from owner marketing or these other aspects of your business. Excellent guest service that would drive revenue for your business. And by getting rid of those, um, you know, it just, it, it would help you move forward quicker. Yeah. Another, another area, you know, that used to drive me crazy with large companies is unit count is the measure of success. <laughs> In reality, uh, a profitable portfolio should be that measure of success for you. And, um, and so a lot of times, if you don't know what your profit margin is per property, uh, and you've got to factor in everything, right? Your, your cost of management, um, your commission structures. I mean, there's so much that goes into that. But really looking at your individual units uh, in your portfolio, are you making money or not? If you're doing this as a hobby or for fun, great. But if you're trying to run a successful business and, and generate you know, revenue for yourselves uh, and, and grow, then, then you, really get, you really have to understand down to the unit level record how profitable that you are. Uh, I hear a lot of companies, man, I've got this many units or thousand units over here or, or you know, whatever. Uh, that that is um, uh, only one one dimension to to look at when it comes to you know the owners and, and the inventory that you take. The other is who are you as a company, right? Is that we've struggled in the past with that unit count issue, and then also managing everything from one bedroom condos and buildings that operate like hotels to, you know, 15, 20 bedroom homes, you know, that are, you know, in, in mountain regions and lodges and the like, you can't market the same way to that wide variety of properties. And so looking at who you are in a market and, and really setting that standard, maybe you're, if you're in beach markets, you're, you're going to take Gulf front properties. They must have private pools. They must be, you know, must be within X of a particular amenity or, or the like, that's a good starting point for you. And then as your ability to fill different types of inventory, maybe in different locations uh, grows, th then maybe you take on some other types of inventory as well, but trying to be everything to everyone was a pitfall that we hit a number of times. Thanks, Lena. We, uh, so Vantage Resort Realty, we would actually go through this exercise every year uh, for pruning. Now, the first year or two, we didn't do it, you know, because obviously it was all about chasing as much inventory as we could. But then we realized that there were those certain owners, those cer certain properties that were just like very toxic to the entire culture, to the entire team. And I realized I was going to lose half my team if I didn't get rid of some of these owners. So what we did is we actually went through a, a formal process every single year. Now, it's kind of good news, bad news, but in, in Maryland, in Ocean City, Maryland, every year, we actually had to get our contracts uh, re-signed every single year. So it's a, you know, it's a bear to go through that process. So what we would do at the end of the season is we would bench rank every single property. And we had three categories. And we actually created a spreadsheet for this. And we kind of did the old uh, green, yellow, red. So I think the red was like the bottom 10 or bottom 15%. And it was ranked on three different categories. The first was revenue to the company. The second was guest complaints or maintenance issues. And then the third one was we would score uh, each owner. Uh, we called it the PETA score, you know, pain in the ass. And if anyone was in all three, if any uh, owner or any one property was in red in all three categories, no questions asked. We did not ask them to renew their contract and we didn't renew them the following year. If we had two out of three, we had a discussion about it. And this was like a, a week, almost like a week long process that the entire team or the entire leadership team would kind of sit down and go through. Uh, and then maybe if we had two that were in yellow, one in red, we'd have a conversation about it. But this was a nice formal process that allowed us to kind of prune and it worked out well. But again, it took a little while to get into this point because in the early days, you obviously want as much inventory as you can, but you realize those bad properties, those bad owners are definitely costing you a ton of money in the end. Brooke, I love the I love the PETA approach. I actually use that from business developers into the um, property managers. They would have to know what category a particular owner that they were attracting were in. And so for us, PETA was a professional, a doctor, lawyer, whomever, somebody with a professional degree. Um, the uh, I was investor. Investor really doesn't care to know you as much. They just want that check and it needs to be growing every single you know, month. Uh, the teachers that were the T. Teachers were someone who's going to teach you how to be a better property manager, <laughs> no matter what their uh, professional background is. 
And then the A was agnostic. They really didn't care. And those were the usually the groups that were most at risk because they felt like we were, as a company, just a commodity, one of 50 in a market, and they would go from one to another and the like. But I love that approach, understanding who your owners are, what bucket that they fall in. Great. Uh, quick question from from me on this because I, I think it, it is a fascinating topic, right? Four four and five acquisition and, and, and wrong inventory. So what I'm hearing, um, we we had a poll, right? And we asked uh, people attending this this session today and whether they know the their own their owner owner acquisition costs. And again, I think three quarters to eighty percent do not know that. And I think Lino had a very good point about. Uh, the uh, understanding the, uh, the 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 margins you have for each each listing basically right you how much money are you making on each listing rather than how big <laughs> the unit count is what what do you think here is going on that people do people don't have the time don't take the time to analyze this what what's that? because probably people know they should be doing this and they I really make sure people leave the session and say okay I know I have to do it, and here's maybe the first first step for me to do it. Should they delegate this to somebody in their team? Should should somebody own this in their team? How to make sure they come up with the right numbers? They actually make these these calculations to know these these costs or these these margins. Yeah, I mean, it's it's imperative to do, and very few people. I'm surprised actually that 29 percent of the people actually know what their uh, their CAC is on this because I've asked this question over 600 different companies. And very, very rarely do I actually get anybody that actually knows what it is. Maybe they do on a referral basis if they're paying a referral fee to like a realtor or something like that. But most people have not gone through the math. But I, I think you have to take it almost one step further. It's not just the, the CAC. The CAC doesn't really matter. What matters is really ultimately the LTV to CAC. LTV stands for lifetime value. So, I mean, a, a CAC on a, you know, a property that's doing $150,000 in gross booking revenue is going to be very different than a, a CAC on a, a property doing $30,000 in rental uh, income. So I would definitely uh, go through the entire calculation there. Um, it's, I mean, it, who owns that? I mean, it could be your mar it could be your marketing team. It could be uh, obviously the business development team, but ultimately it needs to be pushed down from the leadership team. They need to be one that understands exactly what this is, what these numbers are, because there is, there's, as I said before, in one of my previous quotes there was, there's not a greater lever that you can pull than growing your inventory to kind of affect not only your top line revenue, your bottom line profits, but also even building net worth. Um, so knowing those numbers, um, if anybody emails me, Brooke at Vintory.com, we actually have an entire interactive calculator uh, that's on our website. I'm happy to share that kind of goes through, helps you to understand these metrics because it's critically important. And I wish more people would actually uh, take a proactive stance of actually understanding what these metrics are because it is really uh, pretty imperative. Everybody's focused on the metrics on the guest side. Very few people are actually uh, doing this on the, the inventory side. Yeah, I would just add on to that. Uh, there is no excuse for being at the top of a business and not knowing these numbers. I know that may sound harsh, but this is literally the value of your business. When you understand CAC, owner acquisition costs, lifetime value of these customers, um, once you start to dig into those numbers, all of a sudden you're going to realize, wow, I can dial this up and increase my profits. I can dial this thing up and uh, in increase my unit count with the right kinds of units. And I can turn this down and have more money for me and my family. And once you realize that, that, that you have these different KPIs that we should be watching, uh, then it's a matter of adjusting those. And so don't think of these as just like abstract numbers. These numbers are everything for your business. Without understanding these numbers, ultimately you're putting yourself at risk of failure and when you do understand these, you're almost guaranteeing better odds of success. Yeah, I'll give a quick, I, there's a complicated formula to get all of this, but I, I will give just, as long as you fall within industry averages, within your net profit margins, and then also your churn, what percentage of your inventory you lose on a given year, your LTV, your lifetime value is equal to your projected gross booking revenue of the first year. So there's a, like I said, I could show you a complex formula that gets you to the end result, but it's kind of like a little cheat sheet. So if you go out there and you sign up a property that's going to do $75,000 in gross booking revenue this year, if you fall within the industry averages, you can almost take to the bank, that property will net you in net profits over the lifetime of that property, $75,000. So that's just a quick kind of uh, cheat sheet you can use. 
Uh, so just know, again, pulling inventory, getting new inventory is the greatest lever you can pull to get uh, to increase your your top line revenues and your bottom line profits. I'll, I'll add one one last thing on, on this. Uh, when we went into property management, there were about uh, 350 property managers in the Smoky Mountains region. We put a Google ads bid of $100 on every term for uh, owner acquisition because of this exact thing. I had a background in e-commerce. I looked at the lifetime value of these customers. I'm like, even if it costs you know $10,000 to produce one of these customers, it's worth it with what it's going to drive over the lifetime of the customer. Of course, it didn't because we weren't bidding against that many other people. So it ended up being about eight or ten dollars a click and about every 20 clicks we'd get a customer. So it ended up being a few hundred dollars to actually get another owner each time. So one like takeaway piece of advice is don't make the mistake of not bidding to be in the conversation on Google ads and other ad platforms because the the cost that 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 incurs versus the value that that drives is is just so small the ratio is off the charts positive yeah i'm sorry i'll give one more a little quick stat uh, <laughs> that might help people because that's it's important and obviously i'm i'm pretty passionate about inventory but it's uh if you can recover your cac your customer acquisition cost for a new property in the first year or 12 months you are crushing it and what that means is the fr you just think of that first year cost is just covering your expenses. But again, if you keep a property on average for 10 years, which is the industry average, then that means year two, year three, all the way to year 10 is nothing but profits. So that's kind of a quick back of napkin kind of a cheat sheet that we use here at Ventory. There's so much value in, in this webinar today. It's great. And I know uh, we just going to cover the, uh, we're going to cover the last topic of the day, six topic. This, and again, this, how many topics are there in the book? At least 10 topics, right, Brooke? Yeah, so there's 10 topics total. Obviously, we only have time for six today. So if you want to see all those other ones, obviously get the book. And we'll talk about how you can get the book uh, later on here in a second. So that's it. Exactly. It, exactly. Right. Let's go to the last one. All right, let's do it. Number six, technology. And uh, let's see, we have, uh, I like this from uh, Andrew. Uh, over at Joseph Allen Properties, uh, build uh, out your tech for the company you want to be, not the company you are at the time. So again, the sub bullets here was, it's kind of contradictory, but take it slow. But at the contrarian side of that, act fast. And then last but not least is due diligence. So who wants to, who wants to take this one? Lena, you want to take this one first? Yeah, happy to, since I'm on that side of the fence now, you know, which is yeah. a, a different position for me. I, I, I am not a technologist. I, I'm not going to write code. I'm not going to um, you know, develop uh, the next greatest thing. Uh, I'm an operator at heart. So I know what, how I need things to run, what information that I need flowing to me uh, and the like. Um, with technology, we tend to, we kind of hit this in the first slide that we, we chase shiny objects and we're building uh, in many cases, what I call the leaning tower of tech. We put all these widgets together. Uh, none of them communicate well with one another. Uh, and so that's where the inefficiency sort of gets away from you. You might have a slick interface um, and, and looks kind of cool. Maybe it, it does a few things that, that you like. But ultimately, if your accounting department is doing double or triple uh, accounting uh, efforts just to get all of this information from these various widgets into your system and into your P&Ls, somebody is inefficient. The other thing that I see a lot is that with um, you know certain you know types of departments, your maintenance people, or if they're outsourced housekeeping people, I've run into a lot of them that aren't very sophisticated when it comes to how they invoice you and bill you and, and the like. And so when you think about your technology stack, think about how many moving parts have to all be in concert in order for the end result, which is efficiency, we hope, with technology uh, is, is you know, uh, applied. So that would be the first piece. The second piece is not every piece of technology that's out there is the right fit for your business and will actually help to move your needle. The reality is that most companies that are in, you can say, you can take two companies in the same market with the same inventory profile, uh, but they operate very differently. And so, if you, as you pick your vendor partners for your companies, make sure that the interview starts from them to you in how you run your business. Who are you as a company versus one that will just hand you their old box of software and here's how you use it and have a great life. 
Um, that's typically not the right first approach when you pick your vendor partners. The last thing I'll add here is that your vendors should be an extension of your business. They should, you know, be there to service you uh, and and not um, give you the runaround when you need some servicing. I, I hear that a lot that, uh, oh, it's not our software. You're doing something wrong with it or didn't set it up properly or whatever. And, and that's a major aggravation to me as an operator. Uh, you hired them to, su to support your business and do something within it. Hold them accountable for doing just that. So I think uh, on technology in particular, this is one where people project ideals upon what this is going to do for them. They see the shiny booth. It kind of goes back to point one. And they're so uh, in the weeds, maybe in their PMS or their pricing tool or whatever, that they want to believe that this is going to solve their problem. And so I think that's where the, the take it slow comes in. Um, what's the risk versus reward here? Is it really reasonable to think that changing from this tool to that tool is going to solve the problem? Or is it the utilization of the tool? Um, things that you're going to want to take it real slow on, changing PMSs. That's a lot of work for you and your team. You may have internal processes and training that has to happen uh, where you can move a little faster is where there's a new sector where you don't already have a tool deployed and where you're realizing, hey, maybe I'm behind the market that doesn't take away the, the need for due diligence, but it maybe does drive the decision a little bit quicker. So I would say that, um, that with these, we really want to, to dial in, understand what is, the, what is the benefit we think we will get from this if we sign on the dotted line with this new tech provider. And then what is the timeline we want to see this benefit within? Grade ourselves. And if we say it's 90 days, come back and look at it 90 days later. Hold yourself accountable. You signed a new contract. You're paying for a new tool. Hold yourself accountable to get out of it what you actually thought you would get out of it, whether it's a PMS, a pricing tool, or anything else. And I can tell you from, uh, from being involved in tech and multiple industries now, most people utilize about 20 to 30% of any of these tools. So rather than just jumping to the next one and expecting it to solve all your problems, master the one you're on right now and see if you can't get there or closer to where you want to go with it. Great. All right. Let's, uh, I know we're running short on time here. We only have about four minutes and we want to leave a couple minutes for a Q and a, so let's just, uh, we'll wrap it up and then we'll go to Q and a, but again, Thank you, everybody, for coming here. Um, you will be getting a free digital copy of the book. Uh, so thank you for attending. If you want to get a physical copy, please go to Amazon. You can get that, or you can just go to Vintory.com slash book, and that'll hyperlink you straight to uh, Amazon purchase page. Um, look, it is 100% uh, of the proceeds go to advocacy efforts here for the industry. There's no way that I could make a dime off of this book. Uh, all the proceeds, again, are going to advocacy efforts. So really excited to uh, to do this. Um, but yeah, uh, Tebow, you want to open it up for questions? Sure. So we, we do have two questions already. I must say they're more about how to do uh, things, but I will I will cover first one. Uh, first question is from Alberto. And Alberto basically is talking about reservations. And he's talking about the, uh, the importance of capacity for inbound calls outbound calls that today you need to be able to answer that 24 seven. Uh, so how do you deal with the, without letting any requests and answer timely? So how do you, how do you answer calls within one hour? I know it's a bit unrelated to the mistakes, but there was a, if anybody has the answer to these questions, how do you deal with inbound calls? Do we, today it's a mistake not to reply in an hour. Any, any idea who to turn to? So what we used to do in property management days, we contracted with a company called Ruby Receptionist. It was a pricey uh, per call answering uh, service. We used that only for owner marketing to Brooks Point. We never wanted somebody calling in that wasn't going to reach a real person that was friendly that could warm transfer them or take a message from them. They sounded like they were part of our in-house team, even though they were outsourced. Um, and that, that worked great to make sure we didn't miss leads. Yeah, I actually Thanks. had a um, a, a um, call center uh, in in house twenty four seven three sixty five. It was critically important for me to get a person to a real person right away. Um, you can do that through outsource, you know, organizations as well. Uh, but we saw roughly fifty percent of calls that were coming in were reservation, and roughly the other fifty 
uh, were current customers that just had a question about their reservation. So I think you can do a lot with a call tree, you know, press one for this, two for that. Uh, I would not recommend a call tree that's that's got more than two or three options. Um, and uh, But getting a person to the right individual quickly and efficiently is really key on the reservation side. I think an hour is too late, especially with today. Uh, people want immediate response, immediate action. They want to be able to click and book. And that's another thing I would add is if you can't go to your website and make a reservation within three to four clicks, uh, it's time to relook at, at that whole process. Yeah, Mark Robert's uh, former uh, chief revenue officer at HubSpot. Uh, now he's a Harvard professor on sales. He said, if you connect with the lead immediately or call him back within two minutes, you're 10 times more likely to close it than waiting just one hour. Yeah. All right. Uh, so before I take the last question here, once again, you get an email tomorrow with the recording of the session today and the link to download the book, the, the book as a PDF. But uh, um. So last question is, oh, I missed the question. Sorry. Uh, the question is basically somebody was asking uh, about Google uh, vacation rentals, I'm guessing. I'm guessing that they have to pay an option to be listed on Google, to be uh, Google vacation rentals. Anybody has ever tried Google's a channel by chance to answer the question? Is it worth it? I have not. David, have you got any experience on that? Yeah, I know quite a few property managers that have tried this as a channel. It uh, it definitely can pay off. But I think the bigger topic here is to have a strategic budget to try new channels, uh, invest that strategic budget intelligently. Um, and the goal here should be diversification, even more so than, than decreasing CAC. So you have one if now you split across four or five OTAs instead of one for the portion of your bookings that are not direct. You don't want to ever be uh, just completely dependent on one OTA. That's a bad place to be. Thank you so much. We we are over time. I just want to make sure people uh, can know uh, can uh, know how to contact each of you. So, Brooke, what's the best way to reach out? Yeah, either follow me on LinkedIn and you DM me through there or uh, just email me, Brooke, uh, with an E at Venturi.com. Cool. Thank you, Brooke. How about you, David? Uh, LinkedIn and uh, David at staysense.com. All right. And Lino, how about you? Yes, sir. Same here. Uh, LinkedIn or Lino at behome247.com. Once again, thank you, everyone. There's still 65 people connected. At the end, uh, we're over time. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much, Brooke, David, Lino, for uh, all the tips, sharing the mistakes, or uh, helping people guide them in a way not to make those mistakes. Um, and thank you as well, Yuvika, for setting this up together. Thank you all for attending. And I see you very soon for uh, the following Rentals Club webinar. Take care, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks, y'all. Bye now. Bye, everybody. Bye.